بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم may peace and blessings uh, of God be upon all of you uh, welcome uh, dear participants to another compelling uh, Ramadan webinar series uh, organized and hosted by SIGA Center for Islam and Global Affairs uh, today is uh, Monday May 18 uh, 2020 and it is the 25th day in the holy month of Ramadan, alhamdulillah. Uh, my name is Dr. Yasin Saib. I am a non-resident fellow at uh, SIGA, and I also teach Islamic Thought and Civilizations course at Istanbul Sabah Kinzam University. I will be moderating today's webinar, inshallah. It is a great privilege uh, for me to introduce a highly esteemed academic and scholar, uh, Dr. Khalid Abul Fadl. Uh, who is uh, the Omar and Esmeralda Elfi Distinguished Professor of Law uh, at the UCLA uh, School of Law uh, and the founder of the Institute for Advanced Usuli Studies, the Usuli Institute. Uh, he is the author of numerous books and articles on Islam and Islamic jurisprudence. His latest book is uh, Reasoning with God, Reclaiming Sharia in the Modern Age. Uh, today, the, the topic that uh, Dr. Uh, Abul Fadl has been invited to speak about uh, is um, the, titled The U.S. and the Struggle for Democracy in the Muslim World. Uh, we are delighted to uh, have you, uh, Doctor, and uh, I am a, I'm personally a big fan. I, have, I actually watched a three and a half hour Q&A session that you hosted just two days ago. Uh, that's on the Usuli website, and I benefited greatly for, from it. So I'm looking forward to uh, listening to the way this will work, inshallah, as we are going to give you the floor for the next 50 minutes, approximately, uh, for you to engage in this topic. And then afterwards, we will be opening it up for a Q&A session for the remainder of the time, uh, which will uh, commence now and will conclude at uh, 5 p.m. Uh, Istanbul time. So, without further ado, uh, Dr. Khalid Abu uh, uh, uh welcome uh, to today's webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, of course, I cannot see you, but I uh, assume you're there. And Ramadan Mubarak, everyone. Um, okay, well, uh, to start this conversation um, I want I go back to uh, a memory uh, this was shortly after the coup in Egypt and um, I was uh, speaking at the University of Southern California USC I was sharing a panel with um, someone from the State Department um, deputy uh, one of the, uh, uh, I don't, really, I don't actually remember the man's name to be quite honest, but he was well placed in the State Department, and I, I remembered him from the days where I served on the uh, U.S. Commission uh, for Religious Freedom. Uh, uh, back then, he was lesser ranked, um, but by. 2013 or so, uh, the the man has risen in the ranks, and I was also sharing a panel with uh, Shadi Hamid. Um, those who might not know um, uh, Shadi Hamid and his work, uh, he's the author of a book called Islamic Exceptionalism, and the basic basic thesis of the book is one that is very popular with the folks at the Brookings Institute and also very popular with the current administration um, which argues that Islam unless radically reformed and by reformed here meaning uh, radically reconstructed um, along the lines suggested by people like Hershey Ali and, and company um, where numerous elements are taken out of the core of Islamic theology and Islamic ethics and morality 
um, including rejection of the vast majority of the Sunnah and uh, ideas like jihad and khilaf and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the thesis of Islamic, Islamic exceptionalism is that Islam as it exists is irreconcilable with any democratic possibilities or potentials and that Muslims are um, at core, uh, unless radically revised, uh, they are incapable of any uh, rational, reasonable reconciliation with uh, liberal democracy as, again, and we have a very big problem with that in that thesis with how we define liberal democracy, but take it for, for now, let's just uh, assume that we all know what, we, what is meant by liberal democracy. Anyway, and at the time there was a, a rather intense um, heated debate between myself and Shadi Hamid about the idea of Islamic exceptionalism and particularly how the idea of Islamic exceptionalism is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, that as long as you maintain that Muslims are incapable of democracy, that sets in motion a process by which you make sure that Muslims will never be able to achieve democracy um, in any serious momentum. Uh, anyway, uh, at the time, the fellow from the State Department, the, that fellow, I can't remember his name, um, launched into a long conversation about how during the Obama administration, the United States, and again, I'm quoting him or I'm paraphrasing what he said, that the United States was very much willing to accept the idea of uh, reconcilability between um, Islam, again, however we define Islam, because that's a very broad category, and I'm not always sure what people mean when they say Islam. But nevertheless, that's the category that he used, and the category that Shadi Hamid used. Uh, and, and democracy. And that, according to the fellow from the State Department, that it was representatives from the Muslim world themselves most prominently the Emirat and Saudi that argued vehemently with the Obama administration that whatever uh, misperceptions that they might have about the possibility that, again, we'll use the words that were used in that conversation, the possibility that Islamists can coexist with democracy or that they are, in fact, um, uh, can reconcile themselves to democratic values that this is a mere delusion and um, and the usual arguments that we hear in this context that uh, Islamists Islam again however we define that category uh, only will exploit democracy to get into power and once they are in power they will destroy the democratic process and uh, Muslims need centuries before you can instill democratic values into them and uh, they are simply not culturally ready and capable and according to this fellow from the State Department that it was the representatives from the Emirat and Saudi that prevailed upon the Obama administration um, and what was interesting, of course, is that this conversation is taking place during now after Trump has come to power. And um, so it's a bit archaic talking and anachronistic talking about what took place in the Obama administration, because as I will we'll get to in a second, things have developed and changed quite a bit. What's interesting, however, is that that position that the State Department shrouded itself in in this conversation after the coup 
typical representative what what that fellow from the State Department was saying is a rather typical representative argument that you hear hear from career State Department fellows uh, sort of positing the U.S. as sort of a, a confused, unsure participant that the U.S. is always willing to help Muslims achieve democracy, but it is Muslims themselves who are confused and conflicted and unsure. And the state, what can the State Department do but simply take reality as it is? Well, the reason I start with this is that we now know in from everything we know about the background to the coup in that took place in Egypt, what that fellow from the State Department was saying was a gross misrepresentation of what is going on in the United States and a gross misrepresentation of the collective um, uh, what I say, thrust of thinking. Uh, when I say the United States, I mean in the annals of power in the U.S. Uh, where it matters. Uh, the decision makers that really do make a difference. It is true that uh, after the Egyptian elections and the coming of Morsi to power and the events leading up to the coup by Sisi, in Egypt, it is true that Obama himself and a small group of advisors to Obama um, were lukewarm about the possibility of democracy, especially in in the Middle East. Of course, they generalize. Uh, they they speak in terms of Islam and Muslims, although often they mean. Um, the, the Middle East specifically. It, it is true that uh, Obama at times was optimistic about the possibilities for the growth of democracy in the region, but it is also true that his position in, individually and his advisors was far from um, committed. At the same time, the thrust of the American government, the, the, the momentum of the American government, did not mirror Obama's position. Uh, at the same time that Obama was rather lukewarm, we know that John Kerry, who was the Secretary of State at the time, uh, was strongly supportive of the coup in Egypt, uh, met was Abdel Fattah al-Sisi several times, uh, spoke with him regularly. And we also know now that John Kerry uh, belonged to the, a, a liberal, um, uh, although of course a Democrat and with liberal orientations within US politics, but his view of the possibilities of democracy in the Muslim world was, um, uh, to say skeptical, is an understatement. He believed that uh, democracy cannot grow in, uh, in again, uh, maybe I'll use the, the, the expression Arab countries for now, but you know, often they speak in very broad terms, in terms of the Muslim world at large. But that democracy um, has no future in uh, countries like Egypt and Tunisia and Libya and, and Yemen and so on. And that he, contrary to what we would often tell Obama himself, John Kerry went a, a, out of his way to support the coup in Egypt more than John Kerry's position was the position of the Secretary of Defense, Chuck Hagel. Uh, again, a Democrat. Again, technically a liberal. In other words, within U.S. politics, not supposed to be a, a conservative Republican. But Chuck Hagel 
um, in terms of his foreign politics, uh, although, again, officially did not ascribe to the, the to the Clash of Civilizations thesis, officially, Chuck Hagel, in, in everything that concerned the Muslim world, uh, was a straight arrow, a believer in dictatorship in the Muslim world as the only thing that can guarantee U.S. interests and also the only thing that is compatible with the way they saw the legacy of Muhammad, um, the legacy of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, it, it, what is remarkable to me is that also officially people like Hershey Ali and Shadi Hamid um, uh, are officially very influential with Republican, conservative Republicans. But it is undeniable that their ideological influence upon those who are card-carrying Democrats, even from the liberal wing, is simply undeniable. That all, even people like John Kerry would, you know, go into long speeches about how he rejects any idea uh, such as clash of civilizations, but John Kerry was a firm believer that democracy has no future in the Muslim world. Chuck Hagel, again, officially very much opposed to clash of civilizations and Samuel Huntington and so on, but again, a firm believer that democracy has no future in the Muslim world. Now, add to this, that at this core time during the Obama administration, we were witnessing the rise of people who are going to become extremely influential in today's U.S. politics. Jared Kushner was a major player uh, behind the scenes with Yusuf al Ateba, who was um, uh, the United Arab ambassador to the U.S. They were close friends. Um, Kushner met regularly with Yusuf al Ateba, met regularly with Adil al Jaber, the, US, the Saudi ambassador to the U.S., um, partied with Adil al Jaber and Yusuf al Ateba regularly. Uh, in fact, I'll even tell you that um, Kushner, I even know the restaurant, it's called Hamilton in Washington, D.C., where Al Ateba and Kushner would meet and drink and party and, and have very expensive and, um, dinners and talk about how the most dangerous movement in the Muslim world uh, are the the so-called the the, the um, Arab Spring and the rise of democratic movements. Certain players who became far more influential later on, um, like Michael Flynn, the author of uh, The Field of Fight, if you want to read a card carrying uh, a, a card carrying members um, manifesto of of Islamophobia. Read uh, the Field of Flight by Michael Flynn. Uh, Michael Flynn, even at the time that he was removed from his position by Obama, but he remained very influential in uh, uh, influence and in, very influential in in, in um, getting. Uh, Particularly, uh, people like um, Paul Rand, uh, the the senator, Paul, Senator Paul Rand, uh, to uh, lobby the Obama administration um, to support the coup in Egypt and to not support the Arab Spring or the rise of democratic movements um, uh, in the Middle East. Okay, now we, we know that once the Obama administration went away, people like Jared Kushner, of course, rose in prominence and in power. Um, Michael Flynn became uh, ideologically extremely influential, whether he is in, 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 a, in an official appointment or not, uh, really doesn't matter. 
uh, the uh, thought of people like James Mattis uh, here in the U.S., we, we refer to him as Mad Dog Mattis. Again, uh, ideologically, the ideas of uh, James Mattis today are extremely influential. And the Trump administration doesn't bother with the niceties that people like John Kerry and people like Chuck Hagel bothered with. Uh, the Trump administration is rather very blunt um, in in uh, parroting the language and ideas of the clash of civilization uh, civilizations and in the the upholding the broad thesis that the Muslim world is not ready for democracy and that democracy, uh, is something that is a product of a historical process uh, that is exclusive to the West. Um, and that, again, however we define this term Islamism, whatever that means, uh, and Islamists um, are theologically and ideologically incapable of coexisting with any form of democratic governance. Um, now, of course, with the with the Trump administration, people like Shadi Hamid, who back in 2013 was not as influential as he is today, uh, people like him and the ideas that he espoused in, in, in his book, Islamic Exceptionalism. Islamic Exceptionalism has now become like a Bible uh, in, in the State Department and in the uh, Department of Defense, leave alone the CIA or intelligence community, which the intelligence community always tends to be far more right-wing than the State Department. Uh, historically, the White House tended in, in, in the past would, would be as diplomatic as the State Department, and the less diplomatic would be the intelligence community and Department of Defense. Well, today, that no longer holds, uh, that, that's no longer true. The State Department is still relatively more diplomatic in its language, but in its career diplomats, uh, uh, all parrot the idea that democracy is ill-planted and ill-rooted in the Muslim world, and that the biggest, the 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 uh, future for democracy in, in the Muslim world is a contradiction and a paradox in itself. Those who are far less diplomatic, the irony is that the White House itself under Trump had become far less diplomatic in its language. And of course, the Secretary, the Department of Defense and the intelligence community were never very diplomatic in, in the language um, that they use vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim world. Now, but there's a further, a very important development um, how does the, the the U.S. see the Muslim world? Well, under the Trump administration, in the current administration, the way the Muslim world is, other than the xenophobic language about how Muslims hate the West and uh, how Muslims are a danger to uh, the identity of Europe and to American identity as well, other than the xenophobic language, uh, the Muslim world is seen simply as a platform for economic opportunities and a, a, a raw calculations of cost and benefit analysis um, without bothering with uh, things like ideals and ethics. But what has become even far more prominent is the centrality of the notion that the and and this I want to underscore because it doesn't get sufficient attention in 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 the academic world definitely in the US I of course I don't know about Turkey but that the only democracy that must be allowed to exist in the immediate um, vicinity of the Arab world um, 
and the Muslim world at large is Israel. Now, ideologically, um, a, 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 in terms of long-term national security interests, um, Israel must maintain a unique position as the bastion of Western values, and again, whatever that means, um, in that heartland. Now, of course, we, we later on, we learned that um, Israel played a, a significant role in destroying the, the Arab Spring, and in, especially in the coup in Egypt, and bringing uh, Sisi to power. And Israel played a major role in, 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 in joint with the Emirates in destabilizing that region and making it um, inhospitable to uh, the growth of any significant democratic movement. But what is stark in American politics these days is how blunt the discourse is about at the same time, the irreconcilability of Islamic values was democracy and the critical importance of preserving a privileged position and a unique position and an uncompared position for Israel in that region. Now, there's, however, a significant development that I, I want to underscore that Often I hear the question of does the U.S. Um, the, would the U.S. actively undermine the rise of democratic movements in that region? And I don't think the U.S. needs to. What the U.S. has figured out, uh, I, I think through a, a, a long historical narrative, um, is that the 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 um, nurturing and a careful breeding of a class of rulers, often that attend the uh, National Defense University or that have um, uh, uh, a a. a a process of acculturation in certain uh, academic institutions in the U.S. that you, you, it, it, all you need to do is breed proxy rulers that adopt wholesale for all practical purposes the traditional hostility of um, uh, the right-wing evangelical movement in the U.S and the right-wing Zionist movement in the U.S., the, the, their hostility to everything that Islamism represents, whatever that means, again, that the internalize this hostility. And here I'm talking about people like uh, Jubair and people like um, Adil Jubair and Yusuf al Utayba, who are for all practical purposes, they speak English fluently, pretty much without an accent. They were educated in American universities. I know a lot of the professors that taught them. I know how right-wing these professors are and were and continue to be. And it, what is remarkable is that this class of rulers, including people like Sisi and Sisi's family, including uh, 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 anyway so I, I don't get into um, areas that could create me uh, give me uh, cause me a lot of trouble so I'm not, I'm not going to talk about particular students but uh, that are willing to internalize a lot of the thought paradigms that a decade ago was we associated with people like Samuel Huntington. And of course, the way they adopt these thought paradigms and the way the uh, thought paradigms that are practically indistinguishable from people like uh, Michael Flynn or 
uh, people like Paul Rand or even people like Jared Kushner is that the only type of Islam that they see as consistent not with democracy but with civilized values again whatever that means because the the the, the the thing that drives you mad about the discourses of a lot of these people is how ambiguous and abstract the terms are and you're not ever sure what what they mean by anything but anyway that the only type of islam that is consistent with civilized values um is an islam that is emptied of from my perspective all its ethical core all its moral core it's a secularized Islam to the extreme. It's an Islam of fasting and praying, but an Islam that doesn't concern itself with things like justice, not even social mercy, not even social compassion, beyond the, 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 the zakah, but even the zakah, even the paying the zakah is uh, considered to be something that should be a, a governmental function, something collected by the government and dispersed by the government, and the, the government decides who gives the khutbahs and jum'ah, the government decides um, who gets to speak for religion, the government decides, and of course, these are non-democratic governments, and at the same time, an intense hostility to Islamists that, from my perspective, is practically indistinguishable from the hostility that evangelical Christians have to Islamists and that uh, Zionists, or particularly right-wing Zionists, have to Islamists, however they define Islamists. Now, what is a particularly important development in this is that the way language has become co-opted and exploited in, in, in this entire dynamic. So, we know that at the, during the Arab Spring, there was a serious momentum for serious thinking from Islamic platforms about democracy or democratic values and a serious attempt to work through the type of difficult questions that in the 60s and 70s, many Muslim intellectuals did not dare to take on. So, for instance, if you read the writing of someone like Salman al uh and the way that he wrestled with the theological implications of democracy, and also the thinking of many uh, people who are uh, now associated with the Ikhwan or the Muslim Brotherhood or who, or who are actually part of the Muslim Brotherhood. Or even the thinking, even the, the um, uh, conference that was hosted by Sheikh Al-Azhar, the uh, Sheikh of uh, Azhar, I'm sure you know, um, before the coup, uh, where he... Uh, under the auspices of Azhar at the time, um, secular leaders and Islamic leaders were brought together for a frank conversation in at Azhar, and, a and Azhar then issued a document about the major conclusion, and there was serious intellectual work that was going on in, in, in these um, type of platforms. All of this work has been largely aborted after the Trump administration came to power and after the U.S. Uh, after the, the, the U.S.'s proxies, uh, people like Mohammed bin Salman and like Mohammed bin Zayed, found an administration, an American administration, that would fully embrace the way that they saw the Muslim world, which is basically a world that can only be led by dictatorship and military power. Um, so, it is not a coincidence that with the rise of the Trump administration and what I call U.S. proxies, people like Mohammed bin Salman and Mohammed bin Zayed, uh, proxies of Samuel Huntington type thinking, 
and the entire clash of civilizations in, in many ways uh, people who have internalized the paradigms of Islamophobia till it has become second nature to them. Uh, and here I mean Muhammad bin Salman and Muhammad bin Zayed because in my view, they, these are core Islamophobes, whether they realize it or not. Their ideological paradigms are indistinguishable from the paradigms of a Daniel Pipes or a Stephen Emerson or um, a Robert Spencer. In fact, it's it's quite amazing. I mean, uh, uh, the the same rebuttals that I might have to Daniel Pipes would be exactly what I would say verbatim to Muhammad bin Zayed or Jubair or um, Al Utayba and so on and so forth. So it is not a coincidence that people like Salman Al Oda are languishing in prison in in these class of Muslim intellectuals who were we're doing the hard work of wrestling with the inherited theological tradition and asking the difficult question about how can this historical legacy be made consistent with a more egalitarian and a more representative system of governance um, and is that it is something that was represented not just in the writings of Salman Oda, but in a lot of his speeches. And I'm just mentioning Salman Oda as, as an example. Um, uh, for the, 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 the type of turn that this perspective, sort of the, the, the Trumpian perspective, which has become the predominant U.S. perspective, unfortunately, and the proxies of the U.S. in the Emirates and Saudi and Egypt um, has had. So we end up with a rather ironic situation. Now there is a code word. Whenever Saudi and the Emirates and Egypt and uh, the the uh, the pro emirat pro Saudi people in the, in Yemen, or the uh, the pro Haftar groups in Libya. Whenever they want to condemn democracy, it is rather ironic now that the category they use to condemn all supporters of democracy that come from a perspective that is even slightly Islamic is the accusation that they're all Ikhwan Muslimin, Muslim Brotherhood. And so anyone basically who, uh, who, who still believes in the possibility of reconciling Islam and democracy has become in the discourse of the Emirat and Saudi um, and the pro Emirat people like Kushner um, and pro Saudi factions have all become Ikhwan, Muslim Brotherhood. And it's rather ironic that Egypt and Saudi and the Marat have been lobbying the U.S. ever since Trump has come to power to um, categorize organizations like the in, in the U.S. like care, uh, uh, all Islamic organizations that are active in American politics to label all them all as Ikhwan and therefore and to uh, designate the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization in itself. Uh, so that all types of national security laws can be enacted and the Patriot Act can be can be implemented, and it, it, so we end up with a with a, 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 a this bizarre world where that broad accusation of Muslim Brotherhood carries within its folds people who someone like me might not even consider Islamist at all, um, or people who, um, a broad spectrum of is Islamicized thinking from a broad array of perspective, but it's all rejected because they don't adopt a form of Islam of one of two alternatives that is not just current with Saudi and not just current with the United Arab Emirates, but is also current with the US. 
and, and American internal American politics these days. What type of Islam is good Islam? What type of Muslim is a good Muslim? Not a democratic Muslim necessarily, not someone who can live with democracy, but is a Muslim that the U.S. doesn't see as a danger and doesn't see as a threat to Western civilization and doesn't see as fundamentally irreconcilable with American values um, and more broadly Western values. Well, currently as it stands, the only people that we see fit that bill are either of the Madkhali Jami theological orientation, basically those who designate themselves officially as Salafi, but vehemently believe that a Muslim should not be involved with politics other than the politics of obedience to the ruler, whoever that ruler is. Whether that ruler is a Muslim or not a Muslim, by the way, doesn't matter. So the Madkhalis and Jamis in the United States and the ones who get invited to the White House and get invited to Congress and uh, have access um, that someone like me can can never dream of uh, these days, um, or even people from care would not have, um, are those who, for all practical purposes, their 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 theology is sounds very Salafi. They're bearded. They often, uh, you know, insist on things like uh, the misk, um, uh, what what do you call that? Perfume. Um, you know, um, <laughs> some of them even will show up to meetings um, uh, in, in Congress with a swag in their pocket. Uh, they're rapidly um, patriarchal, uh, very much against women's rights, uh, don't like women very much, in, in my view. Um, uh, but the one thing they, they, they the part that, that, makes them very popular with the United Arab Emirates and Saudi and uh, the Trump administration is that they believe that Allah decides who is the ruler and when and the the ruler that is owed obedience is the ruler that has the power of coercion and compulsion and for them that usually means uh, uh, whoever um, is good with the uh, Saudi and whoever is good with the United States. I mean, it, it's it's interesting because in, in my conversations with them, I often ask them, well, would you consider uh, the, um, the um, president of Russia uh, to be owed the same type of duties of obedience that Trump is owed? And they're very lukewarm in responding to that. They're sure that mercy was owed no obedience, that Hukumat al-Wafaq and Libya is owed no obedience. They're very sure that the the government in Yemen is owed no obedience. They're very sure that all the Shia are kuffar. They're very sure that the a woman's place is in her home. But they're absolutely confident that Trump is part of Allah's color, that it is Allah that chose to give, give milk to Trump as Allah chose to give milk to Muhammad bin Salman and to Muhammad bin Zayed. And so it, their virtue is not in systematic and consistent thought. I mean, it, it is impossible to try to make things flow systematically in Madkhali and Jami Salafi thought. The second group of Muslims uh, that I, I want to get to before I'm out of time to do uh, is the a, a, a certain type of Sufism and I don't want to uh, 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 generalize as to all Sufi movements because it's a, really a particular type of Sufism that is particularly embraced by the United Arab Emirates and that has had access to the annals of power 
in the U.S. that is unparalleled. This is a Sufism that is represented by people like Bin Bayya and here in the U.S. by the Zaytuna, um, uh, Institu um, uh, Zaytuna University and um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Hamza Yusuf, um, who um, it, again, what what it, it, although the Jami and Madhali Salafis hate them and they consider these Sufis kuffar, and although those Sufis hate the Jami and Madhali Salafis, but what they both agree on is absolute obedience to Sahib al to to the uh, the ruler who has the power of coercion and compulsion. Now again, we you know people like Habib al Jafri, who is also you know why was Habib al Jafri? Why does Habib al Jafri believe that mercy wasn't owed obedience, but Sisi is owed absolute obedience? Why does Habib al Jafri believe that the uh, the uh, government uh, in Yemen is not old obedience, but you have to obey the emirs of al Majlis al Antiqali, the pro Emirati uh, group. Why does Hamza Yusuf on Bin Bayya believe that Sharia legitimacy is represented by Trump, Mohammed bin Salman, and Mohammed bin Zayed? You don't get systematic, consistent answers. But what I worry about in all of this is that we see very much along with the position of people like um, Michael Flynn um, uh, and Jared Kushner who believe in a, a, in a clash of civilizations, who believe that Islamic culture is fundamentally inconsistent with Western culture, who believe that democracy is the baby of Western values, and it's appropriate only for the West and Israel, but the entire Muslim world, even when the Muslim world pretends to be democratic, they're all lying and they're all conniving. And by the way, part of that discourse is the, their ac constant accusation to Muslims that all Muslims practice taqiyya. All Muslims, even when they tell you we believe in democracy and we believe in votes and we believe in representative government, that they're always lying and they're, 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 they're consistently dishonest. What is remarkable is that when you unpack what Jami and Madhali Salafis say and what the Sufism of people like Bin Bayya and Habib al Jafri and company. Do they believe that there are something like what Islamic values that are inconsistent for the most part with Western values? Yes. Do they believe that representative democracy is something that is good for the West but not good for Islam, for Muslims? Yes. Do they believe that dictatorship and despotism is homegrown in Islamic culture and in fact do they interpret the seerah of the Prophet to de-emphasize the elements of Shura and to emphasize a history of despotism within Islam. So whenever you try to tell them anything coming close to Abu Bakr followed Shura or Umar followed Shura or whatever, they will insist on the recasting of Islamic history as a consistently despotic history. The amount of parallels between these groups and the neocons of the West, of, of the United States is is truly confounding. So I, so I can um, so I will we'll stop it in just one minute um, and then uh, look forward to the conversation. Um, where does this leave us? This leave us? I go back to the idea of self-fulfilling prophecy. Right now, because of the alliance of this remarkable group of um, the neocons and evangelical Christians, with Israel, with the Emirat, with Saudi, uh, with the, the Egyptian government, 
and their attempt to force an extension to themselves in Yemen and Libya, and their insistence that any Muslim that speaks about democratic aspirations is a is Muslim Brotherhood, and that even when that Muslim says, I've never belonged to the Muslim Brotherhood, I, I actually don't know much about the Muslim Brotherhood, they're insisting that, no, you are Ikhwan. That alliance represents a very serious challenge to the rise of democracies, at least in, in the Muslim world, the part of the Muslim world that is in the Middle East. Especially, I'm not sure about Malaysia and Indonesia. I mean, these raise very different types of questions. But a lot of what I say applies to Pakistan, for instance. And it, um, I struggle to convince myself of something that is more optimistic. Um, there was one at one time that we thought that the clash of civilization thesis and its ideas was a marginal and an aberration to the, the, the thrust of American thinking where it matters. But I don't think we can say that anymore. I think where the holders of power in the US, like the holders of power in Saudi and the Emirat, share these, um, from my perspective, deeply anachronistic and deeply ahistorical understanding of the relationship between Islam and democracy. And I'll stop here and look forward to the conversation. Just thank you, Dr. Khalid Abusad. Thank you so much for that um, really insightful uh, lecture. Uh, we have a, a whole number of questions that I'd like to propose. Um, but yeah, you, you covered a lot of uh, a lot of ground, and I hope that we can address all of um, the inquiries that are coming in. Um, so I'll I'll take the first question from um, a gentleman uh, uh, from Facebook. Says thank you for the insightful lecture. My question is that don't you think that the U.S. is more making political calculations in pragmatic terms rather than from liberal perspective, even if they are liberal at home, um, outside the defining factor from them is interests rather than values. A good example is U.S. stance vis-a-vis -vis Egypt coup and also regarding failed coup attempt in Turkey. What, what are your thoughts on that? You know, um, yes and no. Um, uh, if the U.S. will often be willing to um, sustain certain sacrifices to its national interests when it comes to countries like Israel or a country like Britain, mm -hmm. uh, they, they, there, it is without doubt that, I mean, you, there are certain issues where you, if you even attempt to have a frank and an objective conversation, a cost-benefit analysis about how much Israel is costing us on this issue or that issue, it, you will be shut down promptly because it, especially in the Trump administration, there is this belief that Israel is practically like a 51st state. It, it is our baby. Uh, Israel serves us in, in ways that are beyond cost and benefit analysis, uh, beyond national interest. Uh, and a lot of times when you push people to define well, what benefits are you talking about, why is it that we would support the moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem? Why is it that we support the annexation of the Golan? Why is it that we support the annexation of the West Bank or we won't put our foot down? Why is it that we support this 
uh, uh, bizarre so-called peace plan that Kushner uh, has uh, is espousing and so on. And, uh, and there are many situations where we've done the same with certain countries like Britain in particular. But overall, it, it is a matter of realism, real polity. We, we, we in the U.S. do follow the realist school of politics with the vast majority of nations in the world, but we have our ideological favorites. Uh, there's no, does ideology matter? Absolutely. D does the perception that we belong, we are part of the Western civilization, and we are a part of the so-called Judeo-Christian uh, tradition, and that that sometimes might cost us um, things that, uh, well, if if you just uh, on an analytical basis don't make sense, yes, absolutely. Um, and you could, I mean, we could talk about many historical examples. I think it is it is risky to ignore. To, to ignore the the role of ideology and the role that especially that uh, the neocons and that um, a new Christian front, the rise of a, a, of a, of this whole idea that the U.S. is a Christian nation and must go back to its Christian roots. I think a lot of people don't realize the extent to which there are so many influential, influential people in the U.S. that take these ideas very seriously, and the the and and the dreaming up or the the fervent uh, uh, fantasy that the enemy, the natural enemy of Judeo, Judeo Christian civilization, is the Islamic civilization. Um, and, and a lot of times, there's very forced interpretations of that. But, you know, I'll, I'll, one final point before I I'll, I'll ask other questions. I mean, when I read a lot of reports by the Rand Corporation or by the Brooklyn Institute um, uh, or um, uh, what, what's the name of the um, institute that I did work for in Afghanistan? Rand. Was it the Rand? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, yeah. So I was thinking of the, of the uh, Rand or or the Brookings do. Do their reports that become very influential in in DC circles? Do they really make uh, sense on a pure cost benefit analysis? I, I would bet to show you many examples where that they don't. Um, and and a lot of times the the policy decisions can make sense if they understood from an ideological and a biased culturally biased perspective, um, but they don't they, uh, and not simply at a cost benefit type of, of analysis. Mm. Okay, thank you for that. Now I just you know I'd like to ask a question um, in following up with that. It's quite often that I have come across Muslims blaming Muslims within the Muslim world, and it would really it, it crosses countries and boundaries, to be honest. Um, who parrot this notion, this this class of civilizations notion? So we bought into this idea that Islam is, in fact, ideologically and theologically incompatible with democracy. Um, you know, it's what would you say? to that you know i'm actually i'm really happy that you you asked this question um because in in my one of the thing, one of the most alarming things that i've noticed especially since the failure of the of the arab spring um is the self-flagellating muslims i i can't tell you the number of times that i hear muslim intellectuals uh, Muslim students, including my own students in, 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 in law school or in Islamic studies, um, uh, who will say things like, oh, well, you know, uh, uh, 
Muslims, the only thing that Muslims have ever known, the only thing that is embedded in their tradition and in their culture is dictatorship and authoritarianism and despotism, and this is the way we are, and so on and so forth. You know, this is very much like patriarchy and sexism. All, all history is patriarchal. Until the modern age, the overwhelming thrust of history has been despotic and authoritarian. If you want to understand the historical process, you have to understand it within its historical terms. You, you, you can't project uh, our modern epistemologies about the role of civil society uh, and civic virtues and representative governments and limit and accountability and transparency and limitations on government it, you can't superimpose that upon in an anachronistic way upon a past and then see muslims as uniquely despotic or uniquely dictatorial because if if we compare muslims within the historical context there's nothing really unique. They, they've known dictatorship and less dictatorship at other times, but so has the entire world. Um, and we don't, as historians, as Muslim historians, we actually don't pay attention to movements that negotiated despotism or that attempted to mitigate and modify despotism uh, in in very nuanced historical ways, but that self-flagellation unfortunately has become very widespread, and especially um, after I mean it it now has become. And I'll tell you that even among academics and Muslim academics, in in um, if you are a a Muslim intellectual and you um, you want to talk about Islam and democracy in in less than negative terms. In other words, you you see grounds for overlap and reconciliation and compromise and mutual growth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You have very few friends. Um, you, you you risk being called Ikhwan, which in academic circles is pretty deadly. Uh, you risk being called Muslim Brotherhood by the Islamophobes, by the Evangelicals, and by uh, all the people that the Emirat and Saudi fund, uh, which, by the way, is quite considerable. Um, you risk being called naive, you risk being called an Islamist, and so w what you find is that it is, a lot of academics are just silent on the topic, and those who do speak are the ones who are self-flagellating. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. oh, so, um, just as a quick follow-up to that question before I, I turn the questions to the audience. When you say self-flagellating, why, why are there so many self-flagellating um, Muslims? Why is it that we reference history as opposed to theology to make the case that democracy is in fact compatible with 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 the islamic theology why why is it so difficult for us to make that argument I, I, theologically I and, and well i i think it, i mean one because we we are for most of us are the sons and daughters of colonial periods uh, of colonization and i mean look at what happened to people like haridin tunisi or um, or even someone like a kawakibi in egypt who 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 considered despotism a sin and considered their, considered despotism a form of shirk it is it is truly a lot can be understood when you think of the fact that Muslim theologians who carried the torch of democracy in the colonial era were persecuted and 
in the nationalistic era, the era of pan-Arabism and, and uh, uh, staunch nationalisms, were again persecuted, and and then in in the in the post Arab Spring era are once again persecuted. I mean, when you when you have someone like Salman and Oda start to bravely, or someone like Khashoggi, I mean, theologically, people don't pay attention to the fact that much of what Khashoggi said, um, a very, in a very nuanced way, reconciled many Islamic theological concepts with democracy, and and did it on the category he was interested in was Saudi, but a lot of what he said, and especially to young people that attended his conferences and his conversations and so on, and the same thing can be said to Salman al So my point is, is that for a lot of intellectuals, there's a very high price, especially nowadays, for um, attempting that daring thing of talking about Islamic theology and democracy as compatible. And in fact, in my view, not just compatible, but I think democracy is, is, is the only system of modern governance that could be consistent with Islamic theology, that, that every other uh, is not consistent with Islamic theology. The other thing is that self-lagellation is a product of a broken people. And we are a broken people. We, we are, since uh, the, the hubris of the nationalistic era of the staunch nationalisms in the 50s and 60s, and the anti-colonial movement, the, the 1967 disaster, the, the, the loss of Palestine, the 1967 war, the repeated wars between India and, and Pakistan and how they did not go well for Pakistan. And the fate of Pakistan and, and, and the, the, the type of social turmoil that we see in Pakistan, the fate of countries like Afghanistan, the occupation of Iraq, a defeated people engaged in the behavior of, they remind me very much of, of um, when, when I work with traumatized children, the thing that you notice about traumatized children is they blame themselves, they hate themselves, and they hurt themselves. They cut themselves. And I can't tell you so many times, I look at these children and say, you know what? You are just a microcosm for all of us. Because that's what we are. We, we beat ourselves because we feel defeated and we, and and that's a natural reaction but it's something that we must confront to go beyond it's something that we have to be honest about and speak about frankly so we can get beyond it absolutely that's that's so true so dr um I'm going to ask two questions um, at the same time in the interest of time if you don't mind uh, the first one is, uh, do you think uh, one of the few ways to prevent the reactionary triad of the House of Saud UAE CC regime from stifling democracy in the region is by developing a counter hegemonic uh, Islamic bloc of nations that exert their sovereignty from the uh, petro monarchies? Uh, and the imperial and Zionist backers. I'm sorry, I need you to repeat that, Yasmin, because I'm repeating for you. Oh, sure. Okay, no problem. Uh, let me read that again. It's, by the way, it's published. Um, I don't know if you can see it. It's in the published Q&A section. It's the first question. Hang on. Somehow we got... If you click on the Q&A, there's like two boxes. Q&A is like two boxes with a question mark. No problem. Okay, I'm on the chat, but I don't know. It's not on the chat. It's a, uh, it's a different box. There's a show conversation, and then there's these two little boxes right next to the phone. 
like the red phone where you hang up right next to it there's like two little boxes with a question mark okay if you can you could you find it um hang on one second i'm gonna go full screen and I, okay i have the camera mute share more actions do you see two little boxes with a question mark q a I, I don't have it on my on my thing okay um so what i could screen one second okay i'm happy to read it for you again or what i could do is um can you cut and put it into the chat uh, yeah, what I'm going to do right now, actually, is um, I just uh, I just took two pictures of it and I sent it to you uh, in your WhatsApp. It's in your WhatsApp right now. So I'll just do two questions at a time to make it easy. Okay, sorry about that. No, 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 it's okay. Okay. Um, do you think one of the few ways to prevent the reactionary triad of the House of Saud, UAE, and Sisi regime from stifling democracy in the region is by developing a counter-hegemonic Islamic bloc of nations that exert their sovereignty from the petro-monarchies and their imperial and Zionist backers. Okay, that's the first question. And the second one is, what reason would Trump administration officials have to not support democracy in the region? Um, so, um, the first question, yes, I, I think, uh, I, um, what I actually saw the conference that, um, Mahathir called for, the, the conference that was, um, uh, held in, um, in what it, I think it was held in Malaysia, if I, if I remember correctly. Uh, the one that Saudi Arabia um, refused to attend and threatened Pakistan um, so that they don't attend. Uh, Egypt, of course, didn't attend, but I, I believe Turkey attended. And, um, and so, I, do, do you know which conference I'm talking about? I, I hope people still remember it. I saw that as a, as a positive development. I really do think, but of course, I mean, you, you, you can't fail to notice the extent to which Saudi Arabia went beyond cost-benefit analysis to threaten a country like Pakistan um, uh, 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 so that, and, and to try to undermine this conference because, of course, they, they don't want an, any type of Islamic to develop uh, beyond Rabitat al-Alam al-Islami, which they control and which they've completely emptied of any meaning or any um, uh, 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 moral power whatsoever. But I, I, I don't, I mean, I, I don't see any possibilities that could go through uh, this uh, triad of uh, United Arab Emirates, Saudi, and Egypt. In other words, whatever counterbalance, it must go around them. Uh, I hope that it would uh, have Turkey as its center of um, of gravity uh, for many different reasons. Uh, as uh, especially in the Sunni world, I think Turkey has, is a uh, is just uniquely positioned to play that leadership role. Anyway, um, but yes, I, I, I don't think we can surrender to the, to simply give up and surrender to the already overwhelming um, oppressive power that these three countries are uh, uh, leveraging. And especially, I mean, it's not an academic like myself, a Muslim academic feels it in the United States because I know the, the type of pressure they exert on my fellow Muslim academics. So much so that it's very rare to find a Muslim academic in the U.S. who will dare say anything against the United Arab Emirates, Saudi, or, or you know, Egypt is still added to the... Okay, now the, the second um, 
question if you know more. Uh, I, I'll go ahead and read it. It's uh, and then and then she can uh, Grace can repeat it. Uh, what reason would Trump uh, admin oh. officials have to not support democracy in Tunisia? Yeah, I mean that, that's um, a good uh, question. I mean, uh, right now, what you keep hearing again the 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 same. The, by the way, the United Arab Emirates diplomacy is very active in the U.S. to try to constantly lobby within Congress, especially among senators, that Tunisia poses the threat of the, uh, an Islamist victory and that unless, um, unless Tunisia is overwhelmingly controlled, whatever again that means, uh, because they, they propose different things at different times, that somehow Tunisia uh, will pose a greater threat than that posed by Hukumat al Wafaq, the Wafaq government in, in Libya. Which to me is just, it blows my mind, to be quite honest with you. I mean, the, the extent to which, but they found in the Trump administration um, more than willing listeners. I mean, and that's the, the part, if, if you're just going by cost benefit analysis, the US would want stability to set in, in a country like Tunisia, would worry about what type of business it can do with Tunisia, would not to try to undermine it, the political processes in Tunisia and oust um, uh, the party and differently. Uh, but in reality, uh, uh, the attitude of so many diplomats in, in uh, during this current administration, including in the State Department, and the extent to which they'll tell you things like, Oh yes, uh, uh, the, the Emirat is raising legitimate concerns, legitimate, legitimate worries about uh, that the, the Tunisia could become the uh, the back door for the rise of Islamists and the rise of the Ikhwan movement. And then you tell them things like Ghanoushi is not Ikhwan. That's not, and his party is that's not Ikhwan. They're not Ikhwan. I find it very hard that they actually don't know that but they insist on voicing these types of alarmist scenarios so again i underscore that if we were going but simple re real politic and pure cost benefit analysis um the u.s wouldn't want democracy to fail in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah it seems it seems to me that the Ikhwan is sort of like a blanketed, anytime you want to conjure up a collective enemy, you just throw the Ikhwan label on there. Uh, I, I, absolutely. I mean, what, what, so the, the irony is a lot of human rights activists uh, that are that approach human rights from, who say things like uh, 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 human rights, uh, the, uh, ha, uh, Islam has to be a vehicle for the fulfillment of people's dignity and human rights. Then you hear from the folks in Zaytuna or leave alone the, the, the various centers that belong to the Jamis and Madkhalis, uh, or oh, their Ikhwan. Uh, well, I can tell you that a lot of these people who work in the human rights field, I mean, other than calling themselves Muslims, I, 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 many of them have not even met a, human, a single person that that was ever a member of the Ikhwan. I mean, they actually don't know what, what the Ikhwan is all about. But that's that's the accusation that um, is, is thrown around all the time. All right, okay. So the next question um, is, uh, it says here, uh, Shadi Hamid's argument is that democracy can exist without liberalism and currently there are many illiberal democracies such as in India and Israel. How do U.S. policymakers not see that hypocrisy regarding Muslim world and accepting their illiberal democracies? 
You know, this is this is the 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 part where you really feel like you've entered into a Kafkaesque world, because when you, I can tell you that you want to make sure that a senator will will terminate promptly, terminate a meeting with you. Uh, dare to say anything about how incomplete Israeli democracy is, or that Israel is not a real democracy at all. Uh, I mean, for one, it has, you know, leave alone is a violation of international law in Geneva. And so I've never heard any even attempt to, uh, at, uh, even attempt an argument that would, uh, in the case of Israel, that would uh, deal with these inconsistencies. Uh, India um, is, in the current administration, um, the White House um, has had nothing but good things to say about the Hindu nationalistic government of India. Uh, I know that we've, we're, we've tried to get, uh, especially after the, the Kashmir crisis, we've tried to get uh, the, uh, the um, White House and Congress to condemn the human rights record by the current uh, government in India. And other than the uh, what the State Department says in its state, in its country reports, in its annual country reports, uh, we have not been successful. We've met an enormous, enormous amount of resistance. We, we've, had, we've met even enormous amount of resistance, even with the Commission uh, uh, for Religious Freedom, the, the, the commission I used to serve on. Um, so I, I don't see an attempt, to, a serious attempt to actually make sense, make any type of systematic effort to defend these inconsistencies, other than simply what you hear all the time is that, well, you know, uh, Muslims, Islamic theology, but uh, uh, it, 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 there's always a part, the, the danger of radicalization among Muslims, and so the Indian government's concerns are legitimate concerns because uh, the the Muslim minority could pose a threat to a jihadi type threat to the stability in India, and you hear the same thing about Israel, and and, and I, that's exactly what I call Islamophobic. Right. Big discourse. Exactly. Uh, the the next question. Thank you for that. The next question is um, uh, says uh, thank you for your brilliant lecture. Uh, many people uh, sympathetic to mainstream political Islam are listening to this talk. What criticism of the Muslim Brotherhood do you have in terms of their attitude towards democracy and human rights? What ideological and political changes should they undertake to better advance the struggle for democracy in the Muslim world? Good question. I mean, I'm actually not... Um, what, uh, um, I, don't, I, I don't feel well equipped to, to really respond to this question because I, uh, I actually don't know much about the current uh, Muslim Brotherhood movement um, as it exists now, especially post uh, Egyptian coup. Um, the um, and whatever applied to the Ikhwan during the Mubarak era, and I'm, I'm talking about the Ikhwan of Egypt especially, um, and what, whatever one could have said about the Ikhwan during the Mubarak era. Uh, and during the Morsi period, it, it, things are so dramatically different. But I have to say this, my attitude towards this organization is the same attitude that I have toward people who are thrown in prison and persecuted. It's very difficult to blame a victim for, it, 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 they are victims of systematic human rights abuses. If they didn't find um, an asylum in a country like Turkey and a few other countries in the world, uh, thousands of the people who now are, are safe uh, would promptly perish. I mean, they're not even safe in a country that used to 
be safe for for them like Kuwait. Um, mm. Kuwait has, you know, when I was growing up many years ago in in a country like Kuwait, uh, we there were Juan that has escaped Egypt and lived in Kuwait um, in large in large numbers. Now Kuwait is not safe. Um, I guess Qatar would be the other safe place for them. So, in other words, it's very difficult to expect systematic thought that would come out of a persecuted organization. Now, I have noticed from various um, uh, yeah, I mean, I've because I'm not, I'm, I'm not a, uh, you know, I've heard, I've heard and read a lot of criticisms of uh, the Ikhwan, but I mean, other than saying that I don't belong to an organization like the Ikhwan because I, I cherish my ability to think autonomously and freely and to have no boundaries and to admit of no superior that I answer to, but that's the nature of an academic, and I'm not an I'm not a haraki, I'm not an activist. Um, so I mean, I'll leave it at that. I don't. Uh, there is a lot that I can say about various Islamic thinkers, and from my perspective, their failure to understand that it is that the entire edifice of Sharia and the epistemology upon which Sharia tradition was founded needs to be rethought. That there are a lot of things that I think are, and I argue this in Reasoning with God, the, the book that you mentioned, um, in, in the, and a lot of what, but I am even hesitant to say that a lot of what I say applies to the Ikhwan of today because I simply don't know what the Ikhwan of today say. I mean, I, I don't know what their position. Mm. You know what their positions are, for instance, on something like uh, the talaq outside of court or the inheritance shares of a woman as opposed to man. I I don't even know if they have unified positions on these types of issues. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there, uh, there are so many questions. I'm having a difficult time uh, picking because, in the interest of time, uh, we're gonna. It's already five o'clock, but uh, since we started about ten minutes late, we can end at uh, five ten. So hopefully, we'll have time for three more questions. Um, uh, one of the questions uh, is uh, you mentioned uh, the um, madkhali and al jamii uh, groups. Uh, can you please elaborate, or thoughts, can you please elaborate more regarding these two groups of thoughts? I actually had had, had not really heard of them before either, so. Well, Madkhali and Jami Salafi groups, um, uh, the, the reason they're called Madkhali and Jami is, is they're named after um, the um, theological grandfathers of this movement, but they're, they're quite um, odd. They, they are Salafi in the sense, like very much the, their, their law and their theology sounds uh, exactly like the theology of traditional Wahhabism. Uh, they, they hate the Shia, they hate Sufis, uh, they abhor reason, uh, they don't believe in anything such as reform, modernity, um, uh, democracy, human rights. Um, they pride themselves of being Ahl al-Hadith. They, they, they claim that they are literal proponents uh, of the Quran and Sunnah, which they read quite literally. Uh, so they, they, in every regard, they are classic Wahhabis, classic Wahhabi Islam, except for one critical issue. Mm. They believe that whoever is in power, they are in power because it is Allah's will that put them in power. And if you disobey or rebel against those in power, then you are rebelling against Allah's will. 
Now, the contradiction comes where <coughs> uh, they were not opposed to the overthrow of Morsi. So if you're really going to hold on to this, so if you really believe that, so why isn't Morsi being in power, Allah's will, but they believe rebelling against Sisi or disobeying Sisi or failing to support Sisi would be a grave sin. Uh, same thing with uh, Muhammad bin Salman. A, a good example of Jami and Madkhali Salafism is the Saudi cleric who got up and said, if the ruler goes on public TV and fornicates every day for half an hour on public TV, you still have to obey them. And, you, and they are very fond of citing the hadith attributed to the Prophet that you owe the ruler obedience even if the ruler flogs you and beats you. They, they, you know, whenever you talk to them, that's a hadith they always cite. Um, the contradiction comes in that, you know, they, they tell you that, you, I'll, I'll give you a very concrete example. With Jami and Madkhali Salafis, they heard me say things that were very critical of Trump. Their reaction was, brother, this is haram. Trump is there because it's Allah's will he's there. Well, how about the Muslim ban? Listen, he's the ruler. Allah will that he be the ruler. So you can't even condemn the Muslim ban that was instituted by Trump because that goes against Allah's will. That's their thinking. And Makhali and Jami Salafis are the ones that support Haftar in Libya. They're the ones who are fighting with Haftar against Hukumat al wafaq They support the anti-Hadi the, the factions in Yemen. They are very pro Sisi and they're very pro Muhammad bin Salman and very pro Muhammad bin Zayed. And the irony is when you tell them, well, how about the ruler saying that we have to forget about Jerusalem and be friends with Israel and basically embrace Israel as our brethren and say the hell with Palestinians. Jami and Madkhali Salafis say if the ruler says it should be so, then you have to obey. If the ruler tells you forget Palestinians, Palestinians are your enemy and Israelis are your friends, you have to obey. So it, it, as bizarre as it sounds, I am... <laughs> I am deadly serious. This is, they're very well funded by Saudi. So, uh, um, Saudi no longer funds Wahhabi Salafis. They have to be Wahhabi, Salafi, Jami, or Madkhari. Now, Emirat funds <coughs> Sufi parallel to this. The Sufis don't like the Madkhari, Jami, Salafis. Um, the, that the this is the Sufism of Ben Bayya and um, Habib al Jafri and so on. The Emirat it, 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 it pours money on them in the U.S. and in the West. Um, again, that that's that particular orientation of Sufism believes in blind obedience to those in power. But again, when you tell them, well, you know, is the overthrow of Morsi, was that haram? I'd say no, it wasn't haram, because Morsi was never really in power. He, he never really, lam yumakkimhu Allah is the phrase they always say. He never, Allah never allowed him to establish himself as a real ruler, while Sisi is the real ruler. I, I mean, I can't make sense of what is nonsensical. Um, but, I mean, if you don't believe me, look up the literature. Um, no, I, I, yeah. I definitely believe you, Doctor. Uh, I'll leave with one last question. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I can't attend all the other questions, even though they're, they're all very, very good. Um, it says, what would it take to have democracy in the Middle East with all the challenges we have from the counter-revolutionary forces? Do we need, what, do, what do we need? A revolution, civil war? Please give a practical example of what we as ordinary citizens can do. And we'll leave with that question. Uh, I mean, okay, well, I, 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 you know, I often 
this is, as you can probably imagine, this is a, a question I, I frequently get, especially from younger people, um, especially students. Uh, things, when you have the, the Trump administration, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi, and so on, stacked up all against you, and these, um, I will say the, the same thing. It, it, the, insisting upon an Islam that is not emptied of immoral and ethical content. In, in other words, insisting on Islam that respects human dignity, that considers human rights at the core of Islamic theology, in, insisting on bearing witness to what is right. For instance, every time one of, one of us says, no, we will not forget Jerusalem. No, we will not let the Israelis just annex Jerusalem, take the Aqsa Mosque. They're doing something, but more pragmatically and concretely, I I don't think history has come to an end. I, I mean, who, who would have predicted something like the, the, the current pandemic? I think, do, can I tell you that I honestly, Am I confident that the Saudi government won't be overthrown or the Egyptian government won't be overthrown a year from now, five years from now, 10, 20 years, even 100 years? As long as the ideas remain alive, then there is hope. At the point that I would become truly distressed is that if these governments manage to truly erase the liberating theology of Islam and the theology of Islam that cares about human dignity from the memory of our younger generations. Every time one of us writes an article, writes a book, goes out on a demonstration and reaffirms and bears witness to what morally matters and what ethically matters we are actually being a pain in the neck of these people because they, they need it every time we they, they realize that we haven't disappeared, that there are still these voices. The other thing is, I mean, if I was um, living in the Middle East, I would be working all the time to try to support a revolution because I think as long as these corrupt um, military governments in countries like Egypt and these corrupt royal, uh, uh, royal governments in, in the Emirates and Saudi. I, I think the Saudi, uh, I look at the Saudi government as an occupier of Hejaz. I mean, maybe I'm extreme in that sense, but I honestly want my Hejaz liberated because the, the the type of dishonor that they have committed against Hijaz offends me to the core. Um, uh, other than uh, keeping that message alive, it's very important. Um, mm. I, I wish I, 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 I mean, and of course, keep in mind, I'm, I'm not an activist. Um, you know, I, I'm a person that lives with general big ideas, and so. You don't trust my sense of activism, but I can, I, I know that if I lived in Egypt, I, I am, I'm 99.9%, I would be in prison now, because I, I wouldn't be able to um, just stay silent. Uh, I, I would work very hard to overthrow that government because I think it's obscene, and I think it's immoral, and it's un-Islamic, all at the same time. Well, uh, Dr. Uh, Abul Fadl, I think um, advising Muslims to uphold morality and ethics is definitely a very, very good and sound advice. I hope we can start there, inshallah. Um, on that, uh, our time is up, so I wanted to thank you so much uh, once again for engaging us in a stimulating discussion. And I also want to thank the audience uh, for your uh, participation. Uh, but before I let uh, let you go and, and sign off, I just want to make uh, two very quick announcements. Uh, the first one is that on Wednesday, there is going to be a, a special conversation, Wednesday, May 20th, uh, from 1.30 
p.m. Istanbul time to 2.30 p.m. for an hour, a conversation on Kashmir and Palestine and the struggle for freedom. Uh, and uh, His Excellency uh, Masoud Khan, uh, President of Azad Kashmir, and, uh, is going to be uh, participating uh, in this discussion and we're going to have two moderators, so I hope you will tune in for that. Um, and the second uh, uh, announcement is that tomorrow, uh, inshallah, we're going to have another uh, speaker uh, who's going to be uh, uh, discussing uh, uh, Dr. Hussein al kazaz who's going to be, um, he's from the uh, Insan Center for Civilization Studies in Turkey. Uh, and uh, his topic is going to be uh, titled Umma Revival Discourse, A Critical Question. So I hope you'll uh, join us back here again, same time tomorrow, 3.30. And I thank you all uh, once more for your uh, very kind uh, participation. And I wish you uh, a pleasant day. Assalamu alaikum.